Hello, I'm Al Gore, and I want to welcome you to this year's 24 Hours of Reality, Countdown to the Future. Thank you so much for joining me for this event. We have partnered on this year's event with the TED Countdown event, which concluded precisely 23 hours ago. And what a terrific experience TED Countdown was. I was honored to be able to play a small part in Countdown, along with some tremendous climate reality leaders, and we all joined the amazing lineup that Countdown had. And by design, in cooperation with Countdown, we decided to begin this year's 24 Hours of Reality immediately upon the conclusion of Countdown, with climate reality leaders all over the world making presentations, and they've been doing it for 23 hours now, presentations on the climate crisis and its solutions, and they've been given these uh, uh, slideshows and presentations to all kinds of groups in almost every country in the world. And now, 23 hours later, I'm privileged to be able to join this conversation again. And once again, I'm going to be asking some special guests to join me, four other amazing climate reality leaders. And together, we're going to conclude this year's 24 hours of reality. So let's get started. And I always start the slideshows with this image of the Earth from space, which was the first image that any human being ever saw of our planet from this far away, floating in the void of space. It was taken on the first of the Apollo missions to go all the way out to the moon. And on the last of the Apollo missions, this famous image, known as the Blue Marble, was taken. And for a long time, it was the only image we had of the Earth fully illuminated uh, with all of it out of shadow. Uh, now, the, there are only three questions remaining about the climate crisis. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? So let's take them one by one. The answers to this first question, must we change, involve some images and information that are sometimes a little hard to absorb because we're doing a lot of damage. But don't get depressed because the answers to questions two and three are really optimistic and hopeful. But let's start uh, with this image of the Earth's horizon, which demonstrates that the sky is not a vast and limitless expanse. It is a very narrow Ba band around the Earth. It's a, it's, it's a thin shell. If you could drive a car at highway, interstate highway speed straight up in the air, you'd get to the top of the sky in about five minutes. Uh, now, here's the way it works. Uh, this is sort of basic stuff, and some of you know it very well, but the energy from the sun comes into the Earth's system in the form of light that slices right through that atmosphere and it warms up the earth, the earth absorbs the heat, and then it re-radiates a good bit of that heat in the form of infrared radiation back into space and luckily some of the outgoing infrared is trapped and that's what keeps temperatures in an ideal range for humans and for the other life forms on our planet. The problem is we're thickening that layer by spewing more than 150 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the sky every single day as if it's an open sewer. And what that does is it thickens that greenhouse layer and more of the outgoing infrared is trapped and that's what's trapping the heat and driving temperatures up and uh, causing all the other changes we're going to talk about right now. Where does it come from? It comes from a lot of places. It comes from mining coal and burning forests and the permafrost uh, thawing and uh, in agriculture, particularly animal agriculture, transportation and all of these others. But the main source by far is the burning of fossil fuel. And you can see that after World War II, we started seeing a tremendous jump in the amount of CO2 put into the sky from the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, and now there's so much of it accumulated up there that every single day uh, it, it traps as much heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours on our planet. Unbelievable. And that's why the temperatures at the surface are going up so rapidly. 
uh, you know, we've seen records broken almost every year now, and uh, there, there's almost a two-thirds chance that this year is going to be the hottest year uh, ever measured. 19 of the 20 hottest ever measured with instruments have been since 2001, and the five hottest of all have been the last five years. Just this uh, fall, in, in September, it reached 121 degrees Fahrenheit in part of Los Angeles, 49 and a half degrees Celsius. That's, of course, a new record there. And we're seeing new records in lots of places. Phoenix and Miami both uh, experienced their hottest months ever uh, this past uh, July. In Baghdad, it got up to 127 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, 53 degrees Celsius, a, a, a new all-time record. Uh, same thing in Australia. Their summer was last, uh, our last uh, winter. Look at their capital, Canberra. They set their all-time high temperature record uh, last January. Uh, Ghana in Africa set its all-time uh, high temperature record. In fact, the highest temperature ever recorded in the entire continent uh, of Africa was set recently uh, uh, in Algeria, 124.3 Fahrenheit, 51 degrees Celsius. Uh, in, in Japan, 106 degrees Fahrenheit, almost 105.98, 41 degrees uh, Celsius. That tied its all-time heat record this year. Uh, last year was Europe's hottest year on record. All, most all of these countries set their all-time high temperature records. And in India, uh, it, it got up to 123 degrees Fahrenheit, 50 degrees uh, Celsius. Here's one that really is startling to me. This is the highest low temperature uh, for the day. In the so-called cool of the night, uh, it got up to 108.7 degrees and did not go below 107 degrees for 51 hours, two nights uh, straight. And you know, the temperature is going up faster in the nighttime than in the daytime. Uh, and that creates its own problems. But look at this one. North of the Arctic Circle uh, in Siberia, uh, just a couple of months ago, 100 degrees uh, in Siberia, 38 Celsius. That's uh, an all-time record, almost certainly. Now, pulling back and looking at the planet as a whole, this is the half of our planet covered by the Pacific Ocean. And I want to talk about the ocean because most of that heat, 93% of the extra heat trapped by the greenhouse gases, is going into the ocean. And of course, as a result, the ocean temperatures are going up quite dramatically, and the heat is penetrating down below 2,000 meters. And another startling thing about what these scientists have found is half of all this increase has occurred in just the last 20 years. It's still going up. And with apologies to Las Vegas, uh, what happens in the ocean doesn't stay uh, in the ocean. It comes back on the land. And one way, for example, among many, is the ocean-based storms pick up a lot more energy when the oceans get hotter and a lot more moisture. Think about Hurricane Harvey that dumped five feet of rain uh, on parts of Houston, Texas uh, not long ago. The Gulf of Mexico waters were seven degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees Celsius, warmer than normal. And again, it went all the way down uh, deep. And uh, five feet in Nederland, Texas, that was the biggest rainfall total ever measured uh, in the United States. Lots of heroic rescues and these terrible events, thank goodness, sometimes bring out uh, great heroes. And we want to thank all of the first responders and rescuers. But these storms uh, keep coming. Uh, this past September, Hurricane Sally w was uh, a new record uh, to have uh, the fourth named storm make landfall uh, in 2020. Uh, it dropped four months of rain on Pensacola in only four hours. Uh, then Hurricane Laura, the strongest recorded hurricane ever to hit the state of Louisiana. It went from a category one to a category four in one day. That rapid intensification, as they call it, is another fingerprint uh, of the climate crisis. And it's all over the world. Uh, in in uh, the Bay of Bengal, uh, in the area that, that joins India and Bangladesh, 
super cyclone Amphan was the strongest storm ever uh, in the Bay of uh, Bengal in May, toward the end of May uh, of this year, and it absolutely devastated uh, a lot of that area. Uh, and what we're seeing now is, is that the sea is advancing inland in that region 200 yards per year. More than a million people have already fled and migrated to the north. And I want to mention that uh, during this pandemic, uh, the, the rescues uh, and the sheltering of those in danger is certainly complicated for them and for the rescuers uh, by the pandemic. And this has been a particular problem this year. And it's always the poor that suffer the biggest impact. Uh, Pope Francis uh, has been teaching the world about that truth, and, and uh, that, we'll come back to that in this presentation. Here in the United States, the new Poor People's Campaign is now inveighing against ecological devastation, along with the other evils that it is fighting against, poverty and racism and militarism. In Africa, we saw one of the strongest weather-related disasters ever to hit uh, the, the uh, southern uh, hemisphere. But let's look at how the water cycle is disrupted by uh, this phenomena. Uh, you know that the evaporation off the ocean comes over the land and falls as precipitation and then rushes back to the sea. Well, what's happening with the climate crisis is that the amount of evaporation coming off the oceans is increasing dramatically as the oceans warm up so dramatically. And so all that moisture in the air comes over the land, uh, often in these so-called atmospheric rivers. Here's one, let me locate you here. Uh, down in the uh, lower left is Hawaii, and 2,300 kilometers away is Silicon Valley, California. That's an atmospheric river. The day this satellite picture was taken, this is what was going on uh, in Silicon Valley. And this story repeats itself all over as the downpours get much bigger with the disruption of the water cycle, producing these rain bombs, as some of the scientists are calling them. Actually, th these uh, rain bombs and the floods associated with them, the extreme events, now occur four times more frequently than they did as recently as 1980. In, in my home state in Tennessee, we weren't spared. Uh, this year there was a huge flooding. Uh, and, and by the way, it, I, I said I would come back to this. The flooding in the United States disproportionately impacts black neighborhoods. Uh, and we'll see that uh, uh, in a lot of uh, examples here. If you look at the counties that are most vulnerable to climate-related disasters, uh, actually the population in those 10 counties is 81% minority. They're, they're getting the brunt of it. And it's important to realize this. Farmers are getting uh, hit too. This is uh, in Iowa two years ago and then w the year of the awful floods uh, last year. We have seen 20 million acres last year uh, not uh, planted because it was just too wet with the downpours uh, and the floods. Uh, these uh, big rain bombs, Look at, look at the, the graph here, what's been happening to uh, these uh, big anomalies all around the world. We're seeing this dramatic uh, increase. Here in Pakistan, they just, uh, uh, less than uh, a little over a month ago, broke uh, their all-time monsoon uh, rainfall record for a single storm. Uh, we've seen the same thing in India this past June and July, 50% more rainfall than normal uh, during the monsoon. Uh, and I showed Bangladesh before, but this is yet another storm this year that flooded one quarter of that entire country. Uh, in China, in, in part of central China, we have seen fantastically horrible floods this year, setting all kinds of records, effect, affecting 55 million people in 27 out of the 34 provinces uh, of China. Uh, we're seeing it in both of the Koreas, unusually uh, heavy downpours. Uh, we're seeing it in Africa, flooding just last month in uh, September in Nigeria, destroyed 25 percent uh, of the rice harvest in that country and killed a bunch of people as well. 
Uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, more than 70,000 people lost their lives to flooding in May of this year. In Kenya, 100,000 people uh, displaced this year by flooding. In Sudan, they declared a state of emergency, almost 100 people killed by the floods there. In Senegal, uh, they got a full season, uh, a full rainy season's worth of rain in a single day. Uh, in South America, in Brazil, 30 people were killed by this downpour and the flooding and landslides, and we've seen one wet record, wet year after another uh, in the United Kingdom, but you know the old saying, there'll always be in England, the, the pub stayed open, uh, and the inside of that window is spick and span. Uh, my compliments to the hard work that goes into that. But you know, it all adds up, and these climate-related extreme weather events have cost the global economy two and a half trillion dollars over the last decade, and if you compare that to the decade before, that's an increase of a trillion dollars, and it's still going up. We've got to halt this. Now, the insured losses, this is a minor point, but I've got to share it with you. It may, the total may go up a little bit because uh, up in Kentucky, they have this giant replica of Noah's Ark, and they've just sued their insurance company for a million dollars in flood damage to the Ark. Sometimes it's hard to make this uh, stuff up. That's for real. Uh, the reinsurance companies, of course, they track this very carefully, and you can see how the increase in global disasters is really having a harsh economic impact along with the human suffering. Now, switching gears, the same extra heat that evaporates more water off the ocean also pulls the moisture out of the soil, and it makes the droughts deeper and longer, and they strike more quickly. And as a result, we have seen drought disasters that are unprecedented. And we've seen groundwater levels uh, in Europe uh, go alarmingly low. We have seen a, a, a drought that is the worst uh, in, in a century in several uh, Eastern European countries and the worst in 500 years in the Czech Republic. Uh, this is a drought-stricken uh, uh, region of China on a major tributary of the Yangtze River. Chennai, India, the sixth largest city in India, came this close to running out of water because of the drought there. And in the most important agricultural region of Australia, the Murray-Darling Basin, they are going through their worst drought on record right now. They've been suffering for some time now. A lot of people are worried. In the southern cone of Africa, we're seeing 73 million people facing starvation there and also uh, in other parts of the continent, mainly due to drought. Also, conflicts are playing a role in creating that disaster. So naturally, a lot of people are seeing this as a national security issue for the countries dealing with it and for the United States being concerned about it. This is from the Pentagon uh, uh, six years ago. They've long been saying that this is, the climate crisis is a national security issue because of food and water shortages, pandemic diseases, and refugees. And let's talk for a minute about refugees. Uh, the story of Syria. Uh, you know the gates of hell have opened there with the multi-sided civil war, but before it ever started, Syria had the worst drought ever in that eastern Mediterranean region that destroyed 60% of the farmland, killed 80% of the goats and other livestock, and drove a million and a half climate refugees from the farming areas into the cities where they collided with another equal number of ref refugees from the Iraq war. Uh, and the, the ministers in Syria uh, said, we can't handle this. Uh, this is gonna, all hell's gonna break loose. And pretty soon it did, and the Civil War started. There were other causes, but this was the background of it and the principal, the, the single most important cause. And the refugees uh, went into the neighboring countries, but more than a million went across the Mediterranean to Europe, uh, and it destabilized uh, the political equilibrium in several countries in Europe. Even the United Kingdom, when they were debating the Brexit uh, decision, this was the most powerful billboard in the pro-Brexit campaign, showing a, a seemingly endless line of refugees from the Middle East uh, and the slogan, 
the European Union has let us down. Well, that's demagoguery, but we're seeing the same thing in many regions of the world. Uh, and actually, we're also seeing some of those regions getting so hot and so dry uh, that they're becoming uninhabitable. Uh, we, we are seeing in the Middle East and uh, the Persian Gulf and North Africa, uh, we're seeing people come to the conclusion that they can't live there anymore. Uh, you know, for, for example, here is what presently uh, makes up the uninhabitable zones uh, of the earth. But because of the climate crisis, this is what is predicted uh, in the next 50 years where you see these crosshatch lines. That is an enormous part of the populated region of, of the world. Uh, and, and of course, some of it is, is not populated now, but a lot of it is. And so climate refugees could grow to a tremendous uh, total. Uh, the heat index measures the combination of heat and humidity. Uh, just imagine 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 degrees Celsius. That's what it was in this city in Iran uh, not too many years ago, and we've seen that uh, level reached in several locations. In India is another example of what uh, is in store for us. If we don't get control of this, we could see more than a billion climate migrants. This one says up to one billion. Others are estimating a, a billion and a half. Uh, but we have got to realize the, the national security and political implications of this and deal with the climate crisis. He, in the United States, we have seen demagoguery and political conflict over refugees at the Mexican border. People aren't coming from Mexico. We have net negative migration with Mexico, but they're coming from Central America, from an area known as the Dry Corridor, several parts of several countries in Central America. Uh, this is part of that area in June and in August. The droughts have been so severe there, more years than not, that they can't grow anything. The experts who really study this crisis uh, are telling us that these migrants are not terrorists or criminals. They're leaving the places their families have always called home because they're hungry. They want their families to survive. Now, the, the issue of climate migration is one that some people are just grappling with for the, the first time, just beginning to, to talk about. So I, I want to pause here a moment and get a firsthand perspective from an activist who has been working on this issue for years and years. I'm very pleased to welcome Erica Ramos, the founder of the South American Network for Environmental Nigra Migrations. Now, uh, Erica, you've been researching climate migration and you've been working with people on the ground. What are you seeing and why is this issue not getting the attention that it deserves? El tema es que hoy eh, esas comunidades, poblaciones y personas que están en riesgo o se desplazan por el cambio climático están invisibles desde un punto de vista legal y desde, desde un punto de vista político también. Les falta el reconocimiento de sus derechos en todo ese proceso de desplazamiento eh, por grandes eh, impactos ambientales que, que, que hacen con que sus territorios eh, produzcan menos que sus territorios eh, no, no puedan, uh, que no puedan seguir a uh, y permanecer en sus territorios eh, a causa de esos, de esos impactos. Entonces, la mejor manera creo que podamos hacer esas a uh, las comunidades, el fenómeno de la migración climática en general visible, es eh, conocer a esas personas, saber quién son, dónde están y cuántas son a esas personas, conocer sus realidades, conocer sus necesidades y demandas. Porque una estrategia um, para construir soluciones y estrategias para las migraciones climáticas, tenemos que incluir a los propios migrantes. Por eso, nosotros como Resama, 
la red sudamericana para las migraciones ambientales, a través de una mirada regional, pretendemos visibilizar a esas personas y introducir la temática de la migración ambiental en las agendas de la región. Si ya decimos que no tenemos tiempo, que la crisis climática ya está ahí, mucho menos tiempo tienen esas comunidades que ya enfrentan eh, los impactos reales y directos del cambio climático en sus vidas cotidianas. Pienso que, que creando comunidad, que eh, conectando esos conocimientos científico, científicos, los conocimientos tradicionales, podemos construir soluciones más justas, más dignas y respetuosas con lo, las maneras, los modos de ser, vivir y existir de las poblaciones, de las comunidades impactadas, desplazadas en riesgo por el cambio climático. Entonces, me gustaría dejar un mensaje que esas 24 horas de realidad sean también de escucha de sus historias, que consideren las personas impactadas, desplazadas por el cambio climático como víctimas, pero también como protagonistas de sus propias historias, de sus propias realidades y personas con derechos que merecen ser respetados. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad. Thank you. Uh, now, you work with many different communities all over Latin America where people are being forced from their homes uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, the big one being the climate crisis. What can we do to, to take hold of this issue and treat it with respect and dignity? Es muy importante decir que para la formal, formulación de políticas que consideren la crisis climática, es muy importante que no se consideren solamente decisiones desde arriba para abajo, pero de una manera a establecer un diálogo horizontal. Hoy todavía creo que hay una, un, una diferencia de lo que se debate a nivel global internacional, porque no hay una, una aproximación ni un acercamiento con las realidades locales. Creo que esa aproximación es súper importante en ese, en ese proceso de aprender eh, lo, los impactos de la crisis climática, que tiene múltiples impactos económicos, ambientales, políticos, culturales. Entender la crisis climática como un, un fenómeno multidimensional y a partir de eso eh, tratarlo y abordarlo desde, desde múltiples agendas, pero sin olvidar una agenda muy importante que es la agenda y el abordaje de, de esos derechos, derechos humanos. Entonces, es muy importante la preocupación y comprendo con los sectores que deben adaptarse al cambio climático, pero sin la gente, sin las personas, no existe economía, no, hay, no existe estos sectores. Creo que es un tema que tiene que ser abordado en conjunto y de manera a expectar cómo la gente, cómo las comunidades viven y cómo también es la realidad que queremos construir colectivamente. Entonces, creo que consulta, escucha, eh, participación, información, son, son cuatro perspectivas que se complementan y que deben ser incluidas en todos esos procesos. Eh, me gustaría mucho agradecer la oportunidad de representar acá América Latina y que en, en las próximas oportunidades esas historias estén presentes con nosotros, las comunidades, sus rostros, su perspectiva, sus historias, sus distintos modos de vivir y las distintas realidades están, estén presentes para que podamos comprender eh, ese fenómeno como un fenómeno humano Muchas gracias y hasta una próxima oportunidad. Well, thank you so much, um, Erica. That really enhanced my understanding of it. And uh, now I want to uh, switch subjects just a little bit to talk about the role of fire in the climate crisis. Wow, we have really been hit hard. And as you can see from this graph, 
the relationship between temperature and fire is really uh, tight. Uh, when it gets hotter, you get more fires. We're seeing it right now uh, in California and other places. And over the last several weeks in uh, Oregon, tens of thousands were forced to uh, evacuate. This has been uh, a horrible, horrible, devastating e experience in the community of M uh, Medford. Just about all of the 82,000 people were asked to uh, evacuate. Uh, Ashland, Oregon, 2,300 homes burned. Talent, Oregon, uh, some areas uh, of the, look at that subdivision, just completely burned to the ground. Gates, uh, Oregon. Uh, in California, uh, the, the same relationship between temperature and fire is exactly correlated. Uh, and we have seen the results as the temperature has gone up. Five of the six largest fires in the history of California have been this year. Uh, one of them still going on. Uh, and, and we have seen uh, uh, utter devastation in so many counties and so many communities. This one in Shaver Lake. You can, you can see the smoke from the fires in California. Let's uh, stop the globe right here and zoom in. You can see the smoke from the fires uh, in California from outer space. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, San Francisco, the skies have turned orange more than once. By the way, this is at, uh, this is at noontime, 12.48 p.m., lunchtime. Uh, the Creek Fire. Uh, by the end of September, over 8,100 fires in California had burned uh, 3.7 million acres, destroyed 7,000 homes and, and buildings, and uh, unfortunately killed uh, 26 people as well. And the smoke plumes from that creek fire went up 55,000 feet. To put that in perspective, that's 10,000 feet higher than is customary or normal for a, the largest wildfires. And this smoke, too, is going to circle uh, the globe. And since 1972, not all that many decades ago, the average area burned each year in California from wildfires has increased 500%. The Reagan Presidential Library was uh, threatened uh, last year. Most of it uh, was untouched. Uh, the Camp Fire burned over 14,000 homes two years, uh, less than two years ago. But as they say, it doesn't have to ruin your golf game. Uh, look at these folks. Uh, and I understand, uh, but I show this because it's important that we not allow this to become the new normal. We got to react to this. So much is at stake. Uh, Australia, I talked about uh, their fires and uh, uh, boy, the drought uh, and the fires uh, just uh, eight months ago in Australia are the worst they have uh, ever had. Uh, and, and by January, the smoke from there had completely circled the globe. This is getting to be just unbelievably bad. Also in uh, southern Greece, the, the uh, prime minister of Greece puts that down, puts that down to the climate crisis. Uh, and in northern Europe, all the way up to the Arctic Circle. Look at all these fires, uh, even north uh, of the Arctic Circle. And in Siberia, all those fires in California and Oregon, Washington, there were this summer 10 times as many fires in Siberia as all those fires on the American West Coast. And, and the amount burned is projected to increase dramatically. This is a satellite view of some of those uh, fires uh, in Siberia. And in South America, of course, we've seen the pictures of the fires in the Amazon. These are mainly uh, man-set fires to clear land in a horrible practice that doesn't really produce good uh, agriculture and it destroys uh, such value and the biodiversity. But we're seeing it happen uh, and it, it should be stopped. And there's so many people in Brazil who are trying to get their government to stop it. Now let's look at the Arctic a little more closely because something is happening in the Arctic that has global uh, impacts. We are seeing the Greenland ice mass melting four times faster 
than the scientists thought just a short time ago. Uh, and the permanent ice sheet is melting. Antarctica, the same thing. Uh, if you look at the rate of ice melt uh, and ice loss uh, in Antarctica uh, in, in the last uh, uh, decade, you're, you can see here how much it has increased. And that raises the sea level. Uh, Antarctica, Greenland, that's where most of the ice in the world is. And when that melts, we see these cities highly vulnerable. These are the top 10 by population. The top 10 by assets at risk uh, shows Miami is the most at risk. Guangzhou, China, New York, and Newark in uh, third place. That's why this octopus showed up in a parking garage in Miami, uh, because the sea level is going up so much, and storm surges now come much farther uh, inland. But of course, the most vulnerable areas are these low-lying Pacific Island nations. And because of the, the courage of the people who live there uh, and, and their determination to get the world to do something uh, uh, about this, uh, I want to uh, pause again uh, and ask uh, some questions to a friend of mine, uh, Willie Losey. We met uh, in Brisbane last year, and Willie, it's great to see you again. As someone living in Tonga, where the seas have been rising uh, at almost twice the rate of the global average and where cyclones keep getting stronger coming off the warmer oceans and keep getting more frequent, uh, you've, had, you've had to learn a lot more about the climate crisis and I know how active you've been. And, and you already know, because we've talked about it, how global warming transforms the sea and uh, causes all of these problems that Tonga ha has really been, been uh, suffering. And it's not just the, the land, but it's also the culture uh, and the economy. Uh, and, and it's become a nearly constant threat. And I think this is something that a lot of people uh, are really beginning uh, to focus on. Uh, it's not just about one event after which life goes back to normal. It's about an entirely new normal, a new kind of everyday life. I know, uh, well, you are quite familiar with these issues, and I want you to talk to us a little bit uh, about how you've seen the climate crisis transform everyday life uh, in, in Tonga. Uh, so tell us about it. It is um, truly an honor again to be able to reconnect with you this year after the, the, our time in Queensland, in Brisbane last year, last May. Um, may I take uh, my um, salute and also the acknowledgement from our people and also from the Kingdom of Tonga for this wonderful opportunity to be able to participate in this historical um, virtual um, 24, 24 hours. It's the natural resources to sustain life, whether it be from the land, the air, or the sea. It is viewed as the natural resources to sustain life. It is most disturbing from our indigenous perspective that our view of the earth and its natural resources is not shared, nor cared for by those in the industrialized world. What we view as natural resources, the industrialized world views as the natural capital. We Tongan have always viewed the oceans as the highway which connect us to our neighboring island preferent. Our communication highway of some sort, the ocean has always been viewed as our source of livelihood. Food security and the oceans has always been a part of who we are, a maritime people that have traversed, navigated, and conquered the greatest body of water known to man, the Pacific Ocean. Yet we now stand at the helm of a course we can no longer steer. We stand at the brink of no return. We stand to be engulfed by the very ocean that has sustained us for 3,000 years. Without all the balance, all things topple and double easily, all things will crumble. And crumble easily, 
Things may burn, may freeze, may melt, may wither, and may die easily. It's our oceans, or the Pacific Oceans, is on fire. This is not complicated science. This we all understand in, in, intrinsically since the very day we eat land to walk. So let me pose my personal question. Do those countries who continuously refuse to listen to reason, in other words, to human kindness, would you stand by and witness your mother toppling burning, freezing, crumpling under sea withers and ties? Or would your or our humanity lead us to save her? The truest answer is not found in science, nor in politics. We all know where the answer lies. All of us have an obligation for our children's and our children's hope. One of the things that I really appreciate about your work is the way that you think about all the different ways we need to act and how we can use art, for example, uh, to bring the message about solving the climate crisis to audiences around the world. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about the natural solutions that you're turning to and tell us what you think the rest of the world uh, can, can act on? Uh, from your experience and from Tonga's experience. Planting trees on land in Tonga, which is currently doing by our government under the Ministry of Environment, Meteorology and Climate Change. The planting trees now, the fruit trees, we basically planting mangroves at a similar time. But it's not enough. What I mean for that, we keep planting trees, but we see the strength of the cyclone that's constantly increasing and the numbers of it as well. This year was hitting Tonga, Cyclone Herald. While I'm here in the United States, and it was affected one of our biggest food security. It is funded by the New Zealand government as our B project. And basically take away half of our hives. As we are doing this reviving of our food security with B's project. For me personally, I quote what our great Professor Abeli Hau Offer of Tonga was residing in Fiji for quite some time. The ocean does not divide us, it's united us all. And I go back to how important that we have to work together Appreciation of that, it will bring us the greatness for our future and also for our children's future as well. At the moment, we work closely in partnership with the University of Western Washington University, with Professor Dr. David Settler, has an immense and amazing contribution for our organization, which is or High Incorporated Tonga, which is OHAI Incorporated Tonga. We are doing an incredible contribution and asking for who may able to support our journey with our B project. We asked for 50 people to supported us to own a hive in Tonga for one year. And that hive will be able 
to pass it on to educate the, the primary school throughout the main island about PE's project. The second thing I quite like to bring into here is the COP26 next year in Scotland. And this is something that really tore into my heart. If I may ask you, Vice President Alcor, to convince the United Nations, the UNFCC, to be able to planting trees during the COP26 in Scotland next year on behalf of the children of the ocean. That idea came to me when I was walking last year in, in Madrid, where more than 500,000 people were walking and marching. And I am asking if we can be able to convince to have a planting trees throughout the COP and also throughout the world in one day, in the memories of the children of the ocean, our Pacific people. And I'm grateful for all the work you have done for the world. Well, thank you so much. And uh, shifting gears again, I want to go to the health consequences of the climate crisis. It's been called a medical emergency and the most serious health issue on the planet. So how does the climate crisis affect health? In lots of ways, and we'll just look at them uh, briefly. But first of all, uh, we'll start uh, with uh, ambient air pollution because when fossil fuels are burned, the CO2 goes up and creates the climate crisis, but the particulate pollution some people say conventional air pollution, that also increases dramatically and it has serious consequences for human health. Uh, in fact, we have seen also that it, uh, higher levels of air pollution uh, represent a precondition for higher death rates under COVID-19. We've seen those studies uh, in the US and in China and in Europe. And once again, the people that are hit hardest are black people and indigenous people uh, and Pacific Islanders and Hispanic uh, people. Uh, we, we are seeing the death rate from COVID-19 for black Americans 2.2 times higher than for white Americans. Actually, the highest uh, infection rate is among the Navajo Nation. But if you look at the impact on black Americans and you look at uh, the group aged 35 to 44, maybe because uh, there's an unequal access to zoomable jobs. Uh, a lot of the essential workers are affected here. They have a death rate 10 times higher than the same age group uh, represented in among white Americans. This is unconscionable. Uh, and we have got to recognize this and, and deal with it. And in order to do it, we've got to look at many uh, issues and we can't look at all of them here, but I want to cite one for you, family wealth. This is a so-called average uh, black family, so-called average white family. If you look at their family wealth, uh, it, it takes 11 and a half average black families to come up to the total wealth of one average Caucasian family. So that, that metric captures a lot of legacy discrimination uh, and, and we've got to deal with it. And there is a, an awakening now. And it, as we go about solving the climate crisis, we've got to put these concerns at the heart of our agenda. Now, continuing on the issue of climate and health, we're seeing infectious diseases go way up because of the climate crisis. Uh, and, and by the way, COVID-19 uh, came from bats originally, they think. And what we're seeing is that there are five brand new infectious diseases emerging every single year as uh, human civilization pushes farther and farther into the previously wild areas of the world. And three quarters of all these new emerging diseases come from animals to humans. They call that zoonotic, I've learned. Uh, and that's what COVID-19 
uh, is. It came from animals to humans. And a lot of tropical diseases are on the move. Air travel has a lot to do with this, but the climate crisis is changing the places where these diseases take root and become uh, endemic. So we need to address it. And it's not just uh, humanity. Half of all the living species that we share this planet with are in danger in this century, land-based and uh, sea-based. Uh, and so the cost of the climate crisis is adding up. We haven't even talked about uh, ocean acidification, infrastructure damage, some of these other issues. I'll mention one more. It's the number one threat to the global economy. Uh, so the, the uh, stock market is reflecting this. Look at the, uh, the, the rise uh, in, in uh, the stock market and what has happened to energy stocks. Uh, that's because we are seeing an awakening and a shift away from fossil fuels. Not fast enough, but it is certainly beginning. And the big oil companies are taking note. Uh, the head of strategy for BP just acknowledged uh, that a lot of their resources will never be used, won't see the light of day. Uh, all of these companies in the oil and gas sector have recently written down the value of their assets because they realize there is a subprime carbon bubble. A lot of the reserves are just never going to be burned. And so I'd like to pause again and talk to somebody else on the front lines. Dr. Randy Pokladnik. Uh, and one of the reasons we have got to accelerate this just transition to clean energy and get away from burning uh, the coal and oil and and gas, it, it is not just that it is creating a climate crisis, it is also because, as I said, it creates other kinds of pollution. Uh, and in fact, the infrastructure associated with oil and gas refineries, pipelines, uh, uh, compressors, uh, that results in the dumping of all kinds of toxic chemicals, not only into the air, but also into the water. And the people who are paying the greatest price for this pollution, again, predominantly live in low-income communities. A lot of them are people who are suffering from other uh, discrimination. Uh, and a lot of people are really fighting heroically against uh, these attacks uh, on the environment. And I'm excited to, to welcome Dr. Randy Pokladnik, who is a retired research chemist who's become a very uh, passionate and effective environmental activist in the Ohio Valley environmental uh, coalition in Uricksville, Ohio, where that community uh, is facing an encroachment from the expansion of the fracking industry. Randy, thank you for being with us today. You've been living in the Ohio River Valley for decades, uh, since before fracking was this monstrous activity that it is now, uh, and you fight this fight every day. Uh, how have you seen the fracking develop and, uh, and how have you seen it change your community? What have been uh, the impacts, both in terms of everyday life uh, and community health? Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to talk about this, Vice President Gore. Back in 1998, my husband and I bought a little piece of property, four acres in Southeast Ohio, and we decided to build an eco log home and this was going to be our retirement home. And at that time, we'd never heard about oil and gas or fracking or high pressure hydraulic fracking. But quickly in 2015, we learned what it was all about. And um, within you know, those five years from 2015 to today, we've seen this cancer on the landscape explode in our communities. You can drive into the hollows and the forested areas and you can see fracking well pads. You can see uh, the lights from the fracking wells over the hillsides. You can no longer see the stars at night because of these lights from flaring gas. And as this continues, there are pipelines crisscrossing the rural communities and there are compressor stations and there are fractionators and pipelines everywhere. If you go in a plane, you can look down and see the cuts through the forest of the pipelines. So what we thought was gonna be an, an idyllic rural setting, we were going to build our log cabin and then we were gonna you know, enjoy our retirement 
and quite the opposite because now we've mobilized to try to fight this industry. And we found out that along with the physical attributes that are with fracking, we also have other disturbing things that have happened. We've seen neighbors fight against other neighbors and they've chosen sides. Our communities are as fractured as the bedrock below them. Uh, we've seen out-of-state workers move in and set up man camps. And we know from previous studies of other communities that with this uh, workforce coming in, we have drug abuse, we have um, a high rate of um, sexually transmitted diseases, and our communities are not the same as they were before this happened. Right now, one of the other issues that's going on is that uh, we have uh, the petrochemical industry in the Ohio River Valley wanting us to become the next cancer alley and they want to build cracker plants along the Ohio River Valley and they are building one already in Manaka, PA and this this plant uh, alone will put 2.2 tons of carbon dioxide a year into the air which is equivalent to about 500,000 uh, vehicles on the road and one of the other issues that is really disturbing are the fugitive methane emissions from fracking and all the leaks and all the various processes from getting that gas from the well pad to the cracker plant. And everyone that knows anything about climate change knows that methane gas is, is much worse in the short term period than carbon dioxide. So this has become a huge issue that we've mobilized to try to stop this petrochemical buildup of the Ohio River Valley. Thank you, Randy. Uh, another question. How can we reach out uh, and build a sense of common purpose in the small towns and rural areas that are being affected by this, as well as the cities, so that uh, people uh, don't have to sacrifice their health in order to feed their families. And maybe uh, more of them will join us in working uh, to bring about a just transition to clean energy. Well, one of the unfortunate problems with Appalachia is people in the region have resigned themselves to believe that they are a sacrificial community and they only have two choices. They either get a job or they get a healthy environment. And even though Appalachia has supplied the coal and the oil and the gas that has helped economic prosperity in the United States, it seems like the people in the region never really get to reap the rewards from that. And they live in poverty constantly. You can see it if you drive along the hillsides uh, you know, and, and look at the communities in Appalachia. So I work with a group called the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, and it's a very small group. It's a group of uh, grassroots people. They have a huge community of volunteers, and they are going and reaching out into these communities, and they're, they're trying to find common purposes and goals. They want people to be able to have sustainable jobs and healthy communities. And one of the things that they try to do is to really engage local stakeholders they, they want to listen to people, they want to listen to their stories and, and develop relationships. And, and this is really a hard thing to do uh, because right now uh, our world is so divided and it's really hard to build coalitions and reach across, you know, into communities where they often believe that this is the only option. But we need to make people feel empowered, not powerless. We need to inspire them. We need them to see a different path for Appalachia. We need them to realize that there's not just always this one choice that they have to go to the fossil fuel industries. And we know this is possible because there's examples around the world. We know that there's, you know, a possibility of clean energy, regenerative agriculture, energy efficient homes, and mass transit. And right now, uh, in order to fight the petrochemical buildup, we've got a coalition of people that are called People Over Petro. And they're the ones that are kind of spearheading this fight to get the, against the petrochemical industry. And some of the groups that are involved in that are Freshwater Accountability Project, of course, the group I work for, the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, and Concerned Ohio River Residents, Mid Ohio Valley Climate Action, and the Climate Reality Project uh, has members in our, our little coalition. And we want to see a just transition away from fossil fuel fuels towards clean energy. We want to transform our economy from industrial-based polluting sources to a local participatory sustainable economy that provides clean, safe, sustainable jobs for everyone. And I always tell people, I'm, I'm 65, I've lived in the Ohio River Valley for most of my life, 
And I know climate change is real. I know it's happening. Uh, I, I did research in the forest and, and it's not the same uh, forest. It's not the same Ohio that I grew up in when I was just a kid. But I know everybody can do something as individuals. We can all do our part to address the climate crisis. And I often think of the quote that Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Well, thank you, uh, Randy. Because of the new awareness of all the damage that's being done by burning fossil fuels, we're seeing uh, the beginnings of serious divestment from that industry. The biggest sovereign wealth fund in the world just started divesting its oil and uh, gas uh, investments. All of these coal plants proposed in the U.S. have been defeated. All of these uh, existing plants have been retired. All of these uh, newly proposed, all of these plants have had their retirement announced. That's a lot of them that have been canceled. That's a good thing. We're seeing real progress. And we're seeing the use of coal go way down, even as the use of solar and wind uh, now is higher in the amount of energy it produces than that which comes from coal. But we're seeing the taxpayers being forced to subsidize uh, the, the, uh, the burning of fossil fuels at a rate uh, that, that is 36 times more than the meager uh, subsidies for renewables. This is a global figure. Same thing happens in the U.S. So, uh, do we have to change? We've come to a crossroads, like some ancient civilizations that made the wrong choice. We're in danger uh, of really creating a terrible situation. Uh, but the answer to that first question, must we change, is clearly yes. So let's move to the second question. Can we change? And here too, this is where the optimism comes in because we have the solutions at hand. The best projections for wind energy 20 years ago uh, told us that uh, we might be able to reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. But look at where we have come. We, we just blew right past that goal 22 times over. Uh, the installation of wind power around the world is just skyrocketing. It's an exponential curve. Very exciting. And it's because the cost uh, is going down. There's no pollution and the cost is going down. So what's not to like? Some utilities in Texas now have a new rate plan where from 9 p.m. at night until 6 a.m. the next morning, you can use all the electricity you want totally for free. Uh, in Germany, we now see renewables are providing more power uh, than coal. And in England, where the coal burning revolution began, uh, renewables have provided 16 times as much energy as comes from coal. And globally, we have enough wind power to produce 40 times as much energy as the entire global economy uses. So uh, we, we need to get with it. The story for solar is even more exciting. 18 years ago, the best projections were that we might be able to add one gigawatt per year by the year 2010. But when the year 2010 arrived, we actually created 17 times more than that pro projection. And last year, uh, we saw 121 times more than what was uh, predicted. So uh, this is really taken off and the exponential curve for solar is even steeper, climbing even faster. And once again, the cost is coming down dramatically. Uh, so much so that we see in Australia, uh, one in five houses have rooftop solar, two and a half, 2.4 million residences. They're leading the world in that percentage. Uh, and the, 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 the business uh, men, uh, the business leaders, and, and I started to say businessmen, businessmen and women, uh, are, and the investors are now saying that we're right at grid parity, which means, uh, grid parity means uh, the line below which unsubsidized solar is cheaper uh, than electricity from fossil fuels. That's not a trivial difference. It's like the difference uh, between 32 degrees and 33 degrees, or in Celsius between zero and one degree. That, that's a difference of more than one degree. It's the difference between ice and water. And in the marketplace, that's the difference between capital that's frozen in place uh, and liquid flows of capital going to the new 
opportunities for investment. And that's what is happening. We're now seeing global investment in renewables surpassed by a good bit investments in fossil fuels. Uh, and the gap is growing every year now. Uh, last, uh, the last year for which we have the statistics, 88% of the new electricity generation uh, installed in Europe came from solar and wind. In the U.S. Uh, in 2019, last year, we saw 70% of all the new electricity generation coming from solar and wind. Uh, we, we still are burning a lot of gas, but no new coal. Uh, and, and in fact, you know the famous coal museum in Kentucky? They just installed uh, solar panels on their roof in order to save money on their operating budget. If you look at China, last year, if you look at all the new electricity generation uh, installed in China, more than half was from solar uh, and wind. They are installing more than any other country by far. In India, we're seeing the new electricity generation, 55% uh, solar and wind. Very encouraging. India is really becoming a, a leader on the installation of solar. They're now getting bids that are much cheaper than uh, what you can buy electricity uh, for burn from coal. Uh, here's a, an example of what is under construction and approved for construction to begin for renewable energy in India. This is a breakout scenario. We're seeing that in many regions, not quite as much as in India, but this is a, a global story. Uh, one of the investors in India said, you know, <laughs> you'd have to be pretty brave to invest in coal with these changes. And, and we've got enough solar energy in one hour to supply all of the world's energy for an entire year. And it creates jobs, 11 million people already employed in that sector. And in the U.S., the fastest growing job by far is solar uh, installer and growing five times faster than average job growth. Uh, and now that we're seeing battery storage and other forms of energy storage grow, let me rescale that graph to show you the predictions in the years just ahead, a new trillion dollar industry. This is going to make a huge difference because, again, the price of batteries are going down. That's a feature of this uh, sustainability revolution and renewable energy. The largest battery in the world is in Australia, but not for long because in Florida, uh, they're, they're building one four times larger. Uh, Florida Light and Power announced it's going to uh, shut down two big natural gas generating plants and replace it uh, w with uh, solar uh, and, uh, and batteries. Same thing, General Electric uh, in California is demolishing this natural gas plant because it can no longer compete with wind uh, and solar. Uh, Southern California Edison uh, is now, uh, has now announced that it's buying a, a lot of new large batteries. This is a big widespread revolution. Uh, in in uh, Indiana, this is a, a coal burning and gas burning utility. They did the analysis and said, wow, re renewables are just so much cheaper now. We need to shut down all these fossil fuel plants and build new uh, solar and wind. And that's what they're proposing to do. They'll start very soon. Look at it this way. Five, six years ago, electricity from solar and wind was cheaper than electricity from fossil fuels in about 1% of the world. Today, it's cheaper than fossil electricity uh, in two thirds of the world. In five years from now, it'll be cheaper in just about 100% of the world. That's how fast this revolution is unfolding. So moving from electricity generation to transportation, that's now the largest source of CO2 uh, in the U.S. We're seeing changes there, too, with the electric cars becoming more popular and the cost of the electric vehicles uh, is coming down dramatically. Within two years, we're going to see electric vehicles reach price parity uh, in both the U.S. and Europe for SUVs and large cars and soon thereafter for mid-sized cars and for all segments of the automobile market. And a lot of uh, nations, states, provinces, and cities are now passing laws requiring the phase out uh, of internal combustion engines. Uh, the governor of California just announced that it's going to be illegal 
uh, to buy an, a new internal combustion engine in California within 15 years. That sets what they call the direction of travel. And when people know that all these places are passing laws and more have them pending, uh, this is going to be a, a, a revolutionary change. Same thing with buses. Half of the buses in the world are going to be electric within five years. Uh, 35 cities have already committed to buying only zero emission buses. And in two cities in China, they're already, uh, uh, they already have only electric buses. So the answer to that second question, can we change, is yes, we've got the solutions. So let's uh, go to the third and final question, the most important one, will we change? Now here we have the Paris Agreement uh, to build on. Just five years ago, the, every country in the world agreed to go to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. And yes, uh, uh, President Trump said he wants the U.S. to withdraw, but legally that can't happen until the day after the election next month. Uh, and if there is a new president, a new president could give 30 days notice and the U.S. would be right back in the Paris Agreement. Uh, and so let me pause again there, because for me, one of the most exciting developments in the climate movement in recent years is the way that young people are getting involved in incredible numbers. Greta Thunberg uh, is so inspiring and so many other young people. The global climate strikes were so inspiring and we see the activism of young people happening all over the world. You know, all of the great morally based revolutions in the past, uh, abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, civil rights movement in the US, anti-apartheid, the LGBTQ uh, movement, Young people uh, have helped to lead the way, and when they joined it, that turned out to be the, the uh, turning point. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to, to hear from uh, uh, Chibise Ezekiel, director of the Strategic Youth Network for Development in Ghana for the past 10 years. And he, uh, he has been working to help the next generation of activists build the skills that they need to shape climate and environmental policy and to drive change in their home country and around the world. Uh, Chibise, it's so good to have you with us. Thank you so much. Can you tell us a little more about what you're seeing in youth activists today and tell us why you believe young people are joining the climate movement in such amazing numbers and wh what are they bringing to the movement? Thank you Al uh, for bringing me on this show and hello to my fellow climate related leaders. I think that is very important to know that young people uh, are key activists in the fight against climate change and it's very obvious the way we see the momentum, the number of people rallying around um, climate change issues. So the movement is, is getting stronger and stronger and I think that it is very important to recognize that fact. Um, in terms of what we bring to the table, I mean um, there are different actions across the world and I can share our own experience in Ghana. In 2015, the government of Ghana announced its intention to build um, a coal plant, a 700 megawatts supercritical coal plant. And then um, as young people, we thought that that was inconsistent you know, with our obligations to the Paris Climate Agreement. So that led to a campaign that we organized um, to fight against that intention. Uh, so we, we thought that um, there, there are better alternatives or better options um, like uh, renewable energy so we, we embark on a heavy, a, a serious campaign against government, you know, challenging government on the coal plant. And we thought that um, the, the best option is to consider renewable. And I'm happy to announce that after about six months of intensive campaign, the government of Ghana changed its intention or stopped the plans to build a coal plant. And we are now, a country, the country is now pursuing a renewable energy uh, plan. Uh, as a matter of fact, in February 2019, the government of Ghana launched a renewable energy master plan you know, to demonstrate its, its intention to increase or develop renewable energy in Ghana. So for me, I think that uh, that, that movement was led by young people, uh, which shows that young people also have what it takes um, to contribute to the fight or discussions around climate change intentions. Thank you very much. And another question, when you talk to young activists, what do they say they want the older generation to know about? What are their ideas for moving forward in solving this crisis? 
Well, I, I think that um, young people uh, demand a, a couple of things or have some expectation from the older generation. The first one is to put in place measures to guarantee some sustainable future or to protect the environment. It is said that the future belongs to young people. So at least if for nothing at all, uh, the, the older generation must make a conscious effort you know, to leave a, a good legacy uh, for young people in Ghana. The other expectation for young people um, is that um, they must be also involved in decision-making processes. Uh, in as much as we know that young people are also considered as vulnerable to the impact of climate change, we must not also run from the fact that they are also active agents you know, who can contribute to the fight against climate change. So that must be one understood and clearly you know, made provision for. And so we want to move away from the area where the political heads or the policy makers or the duty bearers think for young people um, to a new era where they must think with young people. So young people must be brought to the table for their views and their concerns to also be heard to inculcate them in, in national and international policies as far as climate change is concerned. We are happy to announce that young people um, have been considered in Ghana's climate change agenda, be it the National Ad Adaptation Plan or the NDCs. Um, the government of Ghana has actually won some readiness amount from the Green Climate Fund to develop our national adaptation plan. And in that process, young people are actively involved. So again, for us, it is a good demonstration that young people are also being considered in the future you know, adaptation plan of our nation. Beyond that, the country is yet to submit its uh, revised um, nationally determined contributions to the UNFCCC by November this year. Again, um, young people are also been included in the process. So at least this has shown that we, we also have what it takes and we are happy that we are in the space and we are hoping that this this um, platform or this provision should reflect in all countries where young people are seen contributing, you know, at the local level, national level, regional level and global level in all climate change actions because indeed uh, we have what it takes to also contribute um, to the fight against climate change which can be seen globally all around us. Thank you. Well, thanks again, and let me uh, turn the page uh, again and say that even though the U.S. Uh, is now a part of the Paris Agreement and hopefully will rejoin if we have to leave it to temporarily, uh, state governments are taking the lead. California, New York, Washington, and all of these uh, other states. We're also seeing uh, cities around the United States making inspiring commitments to shift over to 100% renewable electricity. These cities have already done so and more are, are, are reaching the goal every, every uh, month. Uh, both China and India are now on track to overachieve their Paris uh, uh, commitments. And if you look at the business sector, 121 global financial institutions have announced that they are calling it, calling it quits where coal is concerned. They're not going to finance any more coal-fired power plants. And over 260 global companies have themselves made commitments to go to 100% renewable energy. Uh, here are a bunch of them right here. Uh, and they're also signing these uh, agreements to buy clean energy. And that's one of the things, one of the many things, that's driving the market for solar and wind. Not the only thing, but it's an important factor. And the young people that I mentioned a moment ago, this is in my home city of Nashville, we're seeing this enthusiasm and passion all around the world. They have a right to demand a better future. And we, all of us, have an obligation to listen. So join those who are using their voices and their votes and their choices to fight for their future and for the world. Use your voice and your vote and your choices in life. Speak truth to power like your world depends on it because actually your world does depend on it. Thank you.